How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure Luke chapter 7 This is following, I remember last week, the raising of the widow's son. And uh, here's Jesus coming into a town called Nain, and there's a funeral procession coming out, and the woman is there, she's weeping, she's crying, she's wailing. Uh, you have the, uh, uh, the instrument players, you have the hired mourners, and there's a funeral procession, and her son, her only son, is being brought out on a stretcher. He's wrapped up, he's dead, and uh, there is a funeral procession, Christ meets it, and the Bible says Christ has compassion on her. He has compassion on her. A woman who has already lost her husband, now she has lost her only son. Christ has compassion on her, raises her son from the dead, then delivers her son to her. And it's a wonderful show of Christ's compassion. And that's what we dealt with last week, the compassion of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, Christ has been healing. Uh, he has been uh, raising people from the dead. Uh, and the Bible says this rumor went about around about him, okay? This was the... Uh, this is what people are talking about in verse 17. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. So word is getting out about what Christ is doing. Uh, and word had gotten to some of the disciples of John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist from earlier in the book? Well, he still has some disciples, those who are baptized of him and those who are following him. Many of them then began to follow Jesus Christ because John uh, told everybody that Christ was the one who would take away the sins of the world. So many of John's followers were now following Christ. They had seen the miracles that Christ had done, and they have gone and they have told John. Okay, starting in verse 18. And the disciples of John showed him all these things. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out to see? Uh, what went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Well, here we have uh, John the Baptist. And uh, at this point, the reason why John the Baptist is calling his disciples unto him Right? Why is he not following Christ? Why does he have to call his disciples unto him? Because at this point, John the Baptist is in prison. In Matthew eleven two, it says, Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Okay, he's in prison at this point. So just a short summary of this passage. John heard all the miracles of Christ, and he is in prison, and he's hearing uh, all this talk about Christ. And, and now he sends his disciples. He says, and this is interesting, think about this. He hears the miracles of Christ, then he sends his disciples, go to Christ and ask him if he is the one or if we should wait for another. Well, why would he do that? You would think that hearing of the miracles, uh, hearing all that Christ is doing, would simply strengthen his determination that this was the Messiah. But that's not what happened. He heard of the miracles, and instead of being uh, strengthened in his commitment to Christ or his faith in Christ, he sends disciples to question whether Christ is actually the Messiah. Well, we're going to answer that question a little bit, uh, why he did that. So John heard the works, and then he sent his disciples to ask. And then his disciples witnessed the works of Christ again and simply go back and reaffirm to John uh, that he was indeed doing these works. So he, uh, 
uh, John's disciples go back and they recount those works uh, to John. And uh, Christ tells these disciples, you see uh, what I'm doing. Go and tell John all that you have seen and heard. Interesting. They had already known about the works. They go and tell John Christ is doing these works. They go to Christ and say, are you the one? And Christ simply says, here, I'm going to do some miracles just for you, basically. Uh, He's doing this in their audience for a reason. And really, it's for John's sake. He just goes, go back to John and tell him again of the works that I am doing. And then he adds, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. That was a subtle response to John the Baptist. In fact, it was even almost like an encouraging rebuke. Use the word rebuke lightly, okay? Uh, He says to John, uh, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me because John was doubting. John was doubting. Now, it's it's a very difficult passage because John the Baptist, as Jesus said, was the greatest of those born of women. Now, how many of you here today are born from a woman? Some of you didn't raise your hand. I have questions for you, okay? (laughs) Greatest of those born of women, he's saying, this is the greatest man that ever lived. Now, of course, Christ is accepting himself from that. And, of course, he says uh, that the least in the kingdom is greater than John. But up until that point, when God ushers in the kingdom through the ministry of Jesus Christ and all the prophets that had ever come before him, he says, John the Baptist is the greatest. Take comfort in this. Take comfort in this. John the Baptist is the greatest, and this passage is about the doubt of John the Baptist. The greatness of John. He says he's the greatest of all those born of women. The greatest that has ever come. Luke chapter 1. Remember, we're going to refresh our memories about who John was. So that we can understand the role that doubt plays in our life. And we're going to find out that doubt is not disqualifying. And doubt is not damning. Okay? A doubt is, is really a normal part of the Christian life. And we see that in John the Baptist. But let's recount in our minds who John the Baptist was. In Luke chapter 1 verse 15. Uh, The prophecy of John the Baptist, it says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Which is remarkable, because here in our passage, the Lord is saying that he was great. Okay, Uh, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, one of the greatest of Israel's prophets, Elijah. And he's going to go with his power to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This was the ministry of John the Baptist. As we're going to see in a moment, he was not simply a prophet, but he was. He was not simply a prophet, but he was also prophesied of. Okay? Uh, That is a... Uh, designation reserved for only the greatest of the great, okay? Christ was prophesied of, and John the Baptist was prophesied of. So you can look in the Old Testament and see prophecies pointing to the coming of John the Baptist. He would turn many of Israel to the Lord their God. He goes forth with the Holy Spirit from the mother's womb, even with the power of the prophet Elijah. In Luke one seventy six, this is John the Baptist's father, who is also a priest, uh, looking at his child and saying, Oh, that and thou child... Uh, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Just like they would have messengers going forth to a town to prepare the town for the coming of a king, John the Baptist came and he prepared the hearts of the people to receive the Messiah. That was his role, and it was a prophesied role, uh, one that God had ordained for the life of John the Baptist. So he preached baptism, and he preached repentance, and he preached forgiveness, and he preached coming judgment. Remember John the Baptist? He's there in the wilderness. And what did he wear? He wore, the Bible says, camel's hair. I don't know what that looks like, but he wore camel's hair. And he ate locusts with honey. It reminds me of some of the chili yesterday, right? Uh, Locusts and chili. Uh, Locusts and honey. So here's John the Baptist. He's he's a rugged individual, right? He's a rugged individual, camel's hair, eating locusts, living off the land. And there he was preaching a hard message, a hard message of repentance. And people flocked to him. And Jesus said, what did you go out to see? (laughs) Okay, think about this. John's disciples are coming. They're asking Christ, are you the one? Others are hearing this and they're thinking, John the Baptist is doubting. And they begin to think in their minds, they begin to think poorly towards John the Baptist. They start thinking, oh, what's going on with this man? Uh, What has happened to him? And Jesus comes to the defense of John the Baptist. It's an amazing passage that Christ is coming to the defense of another man. 
And he says to the crowd who now is questioning uh, the faithfulness of John the Baptist, he says to this crowd, what did you go into the wilderness to see? Think back, remember? When you and your family and your friends are all flocking to see John the Baptist, oh, what did you go out to see? Did you go to see a reed shaken in the wind? Now, there's different understandings of this phrase. Some people think he's saying, what, did you just go to look at the trees moving in the wind? You might think that. Uh, There's another interpretation, which I kind of lean this way. Uh, He's actually talking about the character of John the Baptist. He's saying, did you go to see a a branch that just sways back and forth with the wind everywhere it turns, as if John is some vacillating character, uh, some vacillating kind of effeminate kind of guy who just kind of goes with the flow and says whatever, whatever anybody wants him to say? Is that what you went out to see? A reed shaking with the wind? And what went she out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, the, those live in king's courts. Uh, you don't go to the wilderness to see people like that. But what went she out to see? A prophet, yea, and I say unto you much more than a prophet. So if you look back to John's ministry, thousands upon thousands from all different areas and regions came and they flocked to John the Baptist. They understood, in fact, some even questioned whether John was the Messiah. So think about this man, this rugged individual, this man in the wilderness preaching a hard message of repentance. And many came and were baptized, confessing their sins, including many of the religious class. Okay, which is shocking. He taught the unvarnished truth of God with conviction and authority. And the Bible says that all men held him as a prophet. Look at Luke chapter three, verse one. And this is where we really see John the Baptist's ministry. Now, this is important for us to understand the, the role that doubt plays, okay? It says, Now, in the 15th year, the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. Okay, these are all those who are in charge. These are all the bigwigs. And then it says, The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Shows you whom God chooses, right? And he came unto all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He's crying, he's preaching in the wilderness, and people had to go to him, okay, to hear this message. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough way shall be made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Uh, He's not uh, worried about keeping the crowd very much, is he? He's worried about preaching the unvarnished truth of God. So he says to these, hey, you've come to be baptized. Who's warned you? You've just come to escape hell. You haven't come to repent of your sins. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Fire. He's saying uh, judgment is coming. He says in times past, yes, uh, we have this religious class. We have people who give lip service to a belief in God. But now the time has come where God is truly going to judge. And if you're not bringing forth good fruit, you're going to be cast out. And so the axe is laid to the root of the tree. True judgment has finally come. This is his message, a fiery uh, 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 message of judgment. So they respond to him in verse 10. And the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? He answering and saith unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we, we do? And he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed you. Really what he's doing is he's showing these individuals what repentance would look like in their own particular lives. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And in verse 15 it says this, And as, uh, and as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. Now we did all that so you can get the picture. When, when John the Baptist was in the midst of his ministry, he was preaching a message of judgment, and people flocked to him. We could look at this and say, wow, he was very popular. We could say, wow, look at the crowds who are coming uh, to him, and, and he, he just had a great reputation. 
But think about what was happening. He was preaching a message of judgment. He is preaching a message of condemnation. And he is preaching that men should repent. A very unpopular message. Yet thousands flocked to John the Baptist. They did repent of their sins. And they waited for the Messiah. In fact, they thought to themselves whether or not he was the Messiah. And it says there is great expectation. This changed the environment of that region. Everybody was on edge, wondering, what is God doing? Is the Messiah going to come? Is he the Messiah? So they're waiting to see who the Messiah is. They're on edge. They're with expectation, waiting to see what God is doing. This is what John the Baptist ushered in. And it climaxed with the baptism of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes to John to be baptized of him in Matthew chapter 3. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so for now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered him. He baptized Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So this is John. Okay, his ministry climaxes with the baptism of Jesus Christ and John is witness to the heaven opening and he's witness to the Holy Spirit descending and he's witness to the voice of God. An amazing life that John the Baptist has had, an amazing ministry with the power of God. And in John one twenty nine, the Bible says, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He, he introduces Jesus Christ as the savior so now christ reminds the crowd this crowd is beginning to question they're beginning to doubt doubt john because john has expressed some doubt of jesus christ christ reminds the crowd just who john was he says it's not a time to question john's greatness because of some doubts he has about me he says don't dare to regard him as some soft vacillating character you remember the authority and the power with which he preached it's the same john he's the same fiery authoritative messenger sent from god as he was when you and your family and your friends flocked to him and everybody held him up as a prophet. Uh, So this is a rebuke of those who would then criticize John the Baptist for his doubts. What this shows us is that doubt does not disqualify you. Now, we're not talking about doubting your salvation, though we do at times doubt whether or not we are saved, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about those who are already saved, but you have times in your life when you doubt the character of God. You have times in your life when you simply doubt who Christ is or what he's able to do or what his character is. And there are doubts within your salvation which do not necessarily doubt your salvation. And I think this is what's happening in John's life. He was still committed to God. He was still committed to Christ, but he had some questions. And we're going to see why he had those questions, why he began to doubt. And I think we can apply this personally to our lives. Why does doubt come into your life? Well, first of all, doubt comes into our life because of difficult circumstances. Difficult circumstances in life bring doubts. Why would John question now? Okay, as we have already said, he heard the rumors of the works of Christ. He's, he's healing people. The blind are seeing. The deaf can hear. The lame are walking. The lepers are cleansed. And now even the dead are raised. So he sends his, his disciples. Go ask Jesus. More miracles, go and tell John again. Why doubt now? Well, because in Luke chapter 3, verse 19, it tells us, But Herod, the Tetrarch, being reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. John, in his boldness, approached Herod. And he rebukes Herod, Because Herod decided to take to him his brother's wife. And John the Baptist confronted him for that. He rebuked him for that. And Herod answered by putting John in prison. So now John is in prison. So from the high point of thousands flocking to John, the power of God being palpable, Jesus Christ coming and being baptized, the heavens open, the voice of God, From that high point in John's ministry, now at this point he may have been in prison for a year or so. And don't think of this as modern day prisons, okay? Uh, This is basically a pit. Uh, This is actually was a palace that was that was uh, transformed into a prison, but it was no uh, luxurious place to be. Here he is in prison, suffering for a year, and he's simply hearing about the power of the Messiah. What does this do in John? Well, he's thinking to himself, I've introduced him as the Messiah. I believe he is the Messiah. 
He's doing the works of the Messiah. He's healing, yet I'm in prison. And he's allowing his personal life circumstances to cause doubt in his life. He's saying, my experience is not lining up with what I thought I knew about God. Here I am suffering. I'm alone in prison. And he's out there doing these mighty works. It appears as if he is the Messiah. But if he is the Messiah, and if I am his forerunner, why in the world am I in prison? Can that not happen to us as well? You can learn about God on a Sunday morning. We've done a study once, multiple Bible studies on the character of God and all of his attributes. You can learn about God on a Sunday morning. You can learn about him through his word. And you think you got it down. You understand who he is until your life circumstances turn for the worst. And sickness comes, or financial struggles come, or emotional troubles, or relational troubles, or whatever they may be. Those things come into your life and you begin to question, wait a second. Is God who I thought he was? Uh, I thought that he was going to give me a life of ease. I thought that he was going to spare me from these things. I thought he was going to take care of his children so that we wouldn't experience these things. And then you begin to question whether or not God is actually who, he, uh, who you have been taught that he is. Don't feel bad if that happens. It happened to John the Baptist. And Christ came to his defense, the greatest among those born of women. Don't feel bad when that happens because you know what doubt does? Doubt serves a wonderful purpose. Because you know what John did when he began to doubt? He inquired for more information. He sent his disciples and said, I need to know more. But he handled it properly. See, he sent his disciples to Christ, to the source, because he wanted to learn more. And Christ graciously, he didn't give them any new revelation. He just reaffirmed what John already knew. So he just tells them, go, tell John. And basically what he's doing, yes, he's, he's healing the deaf and he's healing the lame. But basically he's quoting scripture and he's alluding, as we're going to see, he's alluding to an Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah. And he knows that John will know this. So he says, go tell John. And he's just reaffirming in John's life what John already knew. And oftentimes that can happen to us as well. And how do we do that? We cannot send disciples to Christ and say, hey, go ask him, come back, tell me. What we do is we go to the source, which is the word of God. So when our life circumstances don't line up with what we think we know about Christ, uh, what we do is we go to the source. And we spend time in the word and we spend time relearning and reaffirming who Christ is. And if you believe by faith, if you're a believer, listen, you've come to that place by faith. So what you do is you get into the word, you learn more about Christ, who he is, uh, how God loves us, what that looks like. And then you reaffirm that in your heart and you meditate on it and you think upon it. Christ didn't give him any new revelation. He just reaffirmed what he had already learned. And the same is true in our lives. And that's the role that the word of God plays. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And then it says, And lean not unto thine own understanding. If you go through life only depending upon your own understanding, you're going to be in trouble. But you need to come to the place of faith where you say, God, just show me in your word. Help me to understand. And it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I'm going to give you kind of a case study of this. In Psalm chapter 10. It'd be helpful if you turn there in your Bible. Psalm chapter 10. I'm going to show you how, the, how this particular psalmist handled doubt in his life and questioning God and how God operates. Psalm chapter 10. It says there in verse 1. This is the psalmist and he says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why standest thou uh, far off, O oh Lord. He's saying, God, why are you so distant? Why are you so distant? Have you ever had those thoughts? God, why are you so distant? That's what he's saying. God, why are you so distant? Why hidest thou, uh, thou thyself in times of trouble? Have you ever felt that way? Life circumstances change. Troubles in your life. He's saying, God, why are you so far away? Why are you so distant? This is what the psalmist is saying. Okay, this is his thought. Now, we're going to kind of skim through this next portion, but he begins to describe the trouble. Okay, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they've imagined for the wicked boasts of his heart's desire and and bless the covetous whom the Lord abhors. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all of his thoughts. And he goes and he recounts and recounts uh, all the trouble that's happening, how the wicked seem to be prospering. Okay, but then down in verse 11, look. It says, he has said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. He's still talking with the wicked. And he says, arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. 
Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. But now there's a change of tone after all this. So he says, God, this is my thought. You are far off. You are distant in the times of trouble. This is what all the trouble is. But then in verse 14, he says, Thou hast seen it. Seen what? Seen everything that I have just described. Thou hast seen it. For thou beholdest mischief in spite to requite it uh, with thy hand. Now wait a second. This psalmist in verse 1 says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? He said, God, you're not here. You're hiding yourself. You're not, you're not a part of this. You're not witnessing it. But then in verse 14, he says, Thou hast seen it. For thou beholdest mischief in spite and spite to requite it with thy hand. Well, which one is it, psalmist? Okay, which one is it? Is he hiding and he can't see? Or does he witness all of these things? Which one is it? He continues, The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. The uh, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. You understand? This is what he's doing. And this is what I think will happen in John the Baptist's life. He's saying, God, I feel as if my present situation, my life circumstances, I feel like you are distant. I feel like you are far off. I feel like you are not involved in this. Recount all of his troubles. But then he begins to remind himself of who God is. He says, this is what I feel. This is what I experience. But now let me talk about what I know about God. Yes, I feel like you are hidden. I feel like you are standing afar off. But verse 14, I know you have seen it. I know you have seen it. Why? Because you behold mischief and spite to requite it with thy hand. That is, you've seen it all. And you are going to judge it. And you are going to uh, avenge this. And then he says, the poor commits himself to thee. You are one who takes in the poor. You are a helper of the fatherless. He's extolling the virtues of God. He is lifting up the character of God the Father. Then he says, break thou the arm of the wicked. Verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. God, I know you're ruling and reigning. I know you're not hiding yourself. I know you're not distant. I know you're ruling and reigning. I know you're seeing all this. Thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Ah, he's not distant anymore. He's saying, you have heard it. You have seen it. You have heard it. You are ruling. You are reigning. You will judge the fatherless and the oppressed. How do you deal with doubt? It's okay to doubt. You doubt and say, this is how I feel. And notice the psalmist is saying this to God. When you pray, you can pray to God and say, God, this is how I feel. I feel as if you are distant. I feel as if uh, you are not in the midst of my trouble. This is how I feel. But then you answer that, and sometimes as you pray, you'll notice the Holy Spirit kind of just moves you in this direction. You begin to think about the character of God, and you say, But God, I know that you said that you will never leave me. You will never abandon me. You will never forsake me. I know that all things work together for the good of those that are called according to your purpose. I know that you will never do anything that violates your mercy and your love and your grace and your righteousness and your justice or any other of your character qualities. I know you're, you're never going to do that. So you think about his character, you recount it to yourself, and then you decide how you're going to behave based upon those truths. Yes, this is what my circumstances feel like. But this is who the character of God is. So now am I going to determine that I live based upon my circumstances or the character of God? And then by faith you say, I choose the character of God. Knowing his character, I'm going to change my attitude and my behavior, and I'm going to go forth with a knowledge of his character despite of my circumstances. That is the essence of faith. So that's how we handle doubts. John the Baptist, I am in prison. He appears to be the Messiah, but I'm in prison. Okay, uh, these are my circumstances. So he sends, go ask, goes to the source. This is like us going to the word of God. He goes to the source. Christ reaffirms it. And then this serves as a comfort to John. Things didn't get better for John. They got worse. But this enabled John with faith to change his attitude, to strengthen his faith uh, based upon who he knew now Christ was without a doubt. So... What causes us to doubt? Difficult circumstances in life at times cause us to doubt. That's not unusual. You know, sometimes Christians get into trouble because we uh, are harder on ourselves than God is. Believe it or not. Harder on ourselves than God is. So you doubt and say, I'm such a wicked person. How could I dare doubt the person of God? Listen, John the Baptist, greatest of all that have ever born of women, doubted and Christ offended him. Doubt is not a bad thing. 
What you do with the doubt could be a bad thing. You just handle the doubt in a very biblical way, the way that John the Baptist did and the way that this psalmist did. Difficult life circumstances, number two, and there's only three of these, okay? Number two, what else causes doubt? Incomplete knowledge of Scripture. Incomplete knowledge of Scripture. If we are going to go to the source and figure out who God is, but we don't have any knowledge of the Word of God, or a very limited knowledge of the Word of God, you're not going to have many tools in your arsenal uh, to encourage yourself in who God is if you don't know the Word of God. So when trouble comes and then you say, hey, I need to get into the Word because I'm facing trouble, and then you're at a loss, where do I start? What, where do I begin? I don't know this book. You're going to find it difficult to be encouraged in times of doubt. John was very familiar with the Old Testament prophecies of the, prophecies of the Messiah. Now compare these prophecies to what Christ told John's disciples to tell him. Verse 22 of our passage of Luke 7. Then Jesus answering and said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. Now compare that to these Old Testament prophecies. Isaiah 35 verse 5. Now John would have known these. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Prophecy of the Messiah. Blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame man will leap, the tongue will be loosened. And he's just saying uh, streams of water, there'll be life. Uh, and this is what happened during Christ's ministry. Everywhere he went, uh, people were healed indiscriminately. Okay, that's one. Isaiah twenty nine eighteen. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Again, a prophecy of those being healed through the ministry of the Messiah. So now what's the problem? John knew those, so didn't he, didn't he know this was the Messiah? Well, there's another prophecy. Isaiah 61.1. This is the one, remember, when Christ is in the synagogue, and he's handed the scroll, and he unrolls it, and he reads it. And this is the passage. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Remember Christ says there that, uh, yes, all these are being healed, but he says the gospel is being preached to the poor. The gospel is being preached to the poor. That's taken from this verse. He hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Okay. John understood all that. But the very next phrase says, to, pro to proclaim liberty to the captives in the opening of the prison to them that are bound. John says, I see the healings. I see the lame. I know the blind are seeing. I know the deaf are hearing. I see all that. But I also know that when the Messiah comes, he will heal. But he will also open the prison doors for those that are bound. And John says, this is not my experience. I know what scripture says, but it's not happening. So John begins to question. Maybe, maybe he, Christ is a great prophet, but maybe there's another one to come. Uh, because what he understood about Scripture was not lining up with his experience. He had an incomplete understanding of God's Word, as we're going to see in a moment. This is not uncommon. Remember when the, Pharise or the Sadducees came to Jesus Christ? They don't believe in the resurrection, so they tried to trip him up. And they said, it's told this big story. Jesus, hypothetical. Jesus, there's this woman. She's had seven husbands. Uh, they're all brothers. Uh, you don't want to be seventh in line of that, right? But uh, here's a woman, and uh, she got seven, seven brothers. Seven husbands, they're all brothers. One dies, she marries the next one, that one dies, marries the next one, that one dies, marries the next one, that one dies, and marries the next one, that one dies. And uh, the Sadducees say, so when they rise from the dead, whose wife will she be? Whose husband will be her husband out of those seven? They're trying to say, well, obviously the, uh, the resurrection cannot be true because look at our hypothetical question. Beware, by the way, of those who would question the word of God based upon hypothetical uh, situations. But then Jesus responded to these Sadducees in Matthew twenty two twenty nine. He says, ye do err. You are in error. Why? Not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. He's saying this whole thing that you have arranged here, this whole idea that you're basing your doubt upon, uh, it's all based upon wrong thinking about the word of God. You just don't get it. You don't understand scripture. If, if you understood scripture properly, uh, you wouldn't be thinking this way. This is what happens to many. They doubt because they don't understand the word of God. For instance, the Christian, newly saved. I'm a believer, I'm a new believer. And then I begin to face trials in my life. Or let's put it this way. You begin to face persecution in your life. You go home and tell your family about the gospel. And they don't receive it. And you're shocked. 
I thought everybody would want to be saved. And they begin to turn on you. And you say, this can't be right. What's going on? This doesn't seem right. You don't know the scriptures. Because Jesus said that the world hated him, they'll also hate you. He said that a man's enemies will be those of his own household. If you knew scriptures, you would say, wow, wow, what's happening in my life aligns perfectly with the word of God. But if you don't know scripture, you're going to think something's wrong. It's interesting in scripture that uh, Paul often, he'll he'll use the phrase in his writings, he'll say, don't be ignorant. I, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. And then he'll give some truth. In Romans 11, there were those thinking that God had given up on Israel. And he goes, no, I don't want you to be ignorant because uh, of the fact that blindness has in part come upon Israel, temporary blindness. He says, let me give you this biblical truth so I can change your thinking. 1 Thessalonians 4. These people were worried. They were doubting whether the rapture was going to happen or whether it had already happened uh, because those who were saved, who had already de- already died, here they are in the grave, and they say, well, what happened to them? And they begin to doubt in their mind about resurrection. And Paul says to them that I don't want you to be ignorant about those who are already asleep, those who have already died, and he gives them some truth about resurrection. Incomplete knowledge of Scripture leads to doubt. In 2 Peter 3, there are those saying that God does not, he's not going to judge. Uh, it's been so long and God has not judged. Uh, he's never going to judge us, so we can just live however we want. And Peter says uh, that God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. We can talk about judgment, how God will judge. And a day with God is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Uh, so he is going to judge. Uh, you are ignorant about who God is, how he operates in Scripture. So incomplete understanding of Scripture can lead to doubt. So think about that. If you want to have a strong faith... You've got to have a strong knowledge of the word of God so that when troubles come and you want to interpret your life circumstances, you can compare it to the word of God. But if you don't have the knowledge of the word, you're going to have a lot of wrong thinking about your life, about who God is, how he operates, and who Christ is. So much of our confusion and doubt regarding who God is, how he operates, and what we can expect in this life can be cleared up if we only had a thorough knowledge of the word of God. If we knew God's character, knew how he operates, and knew what to expect out of this life, then we would doubt far less. The Bible does say Christians will face trials. In fact, in 1 Peter 4, it says, don't think it's strange. Don't think it's strange, this trial that you're going. Don't think of that as strange. We're also going to experience the consequences of a sin-cursed world. The Bible says that all of creation groans and travails together in pain until now, saying sin has affected the entire world. Uh, creation so cancer and sickness and disease and death we will experience all that and God hasn't exempted Christians from that okay he hasn't exempted us from that you got to understand that if you don't understand that biblical truth you're going to wonder why am I facing all this I'm a Christian but no we're all subject to this that's a biblical truth there's going to be times according to Romans 7 Paul's battle with the flesh there's going to be times when you're drawn away by sin And you're going to struggle. And you're going to experience a struggle between your flesh and the spirit. This is the nature of the Christian life. You've got to know that. Otherwise, after you get saved and you still fall into sin, you're going to get real discouraged. And you're going to start thinking, am I even saved? Yeah. Read Romans 7. You'll see that's the battle that every Christian experiences. We will at times experience hatred and persecution from the world. That's normal. The Bible says that's very normal. And Christ says, if you love me and live like me, you're going to be persecuted like me. So we can experience all those problems. But you see, you see the advantage of knowing Scripture? If you know those truths and that happens in your life, uh, it's going to clear up a lot of doubts. Now, John had... Uh, it, it, there's something in Scripture. I don't want to get too detailed here. There's something in Scripture. If you study theology, something called... It sounds very basic. There's a, there's a concept of the already and not yet. Already and not yet. There's a lot of things in Scripture. Uh, you read the Old Testament, you see prophecies, and you say, oh, that's going to talk about, that's talking about the kingdom when Christ comes back and rules for a thousand years. Yeah, it is, but it's also talking about immediately when Christ came the first time. So there's some things you read in Scripture as prophecy that have happened already, and they have not happened yet. Uh, they're partially fulfilled now, or they're fulfilled in kind of a different way now, but they're going to be fulfilled in, uh, completely then. That is true of so much prophecy in the Bible, and you've got to understand that. And uh, John missed this a little bit uh, when it talks about making the captives free. Of course, there's a spiritual aspect to that, when those who are captive to sin uh, that Christ would make free. Uh, it's not that he, uh, he didn't understand it, but he just didn't have full revelation. 
difficult circumstances in life, an incomplete knowledge of Scripture, and then lastly, what causes doubt? Erroneous expectations of Christ. Say wrong, wrong expectations. Erroneous expectations of Christ. It says in Luke seven nineteen. John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Are you the one? So how could he doubt? When he's the one who declared the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, how could he doubt? Well, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, remember it's talking about the prophets who wrote Scripture? And it says that they, after they had written Scripture, 1 Peter 1, 11, it says that they looked into the Scriptures, one ten of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. He's saying they wrote about the coming salvation. They wrote about Christ and the salvation that would come, but they didn't even understand. So they would write it, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, after it was completed, then they would inquire into what was written to figure out what it meant. You see, just because these men prophesied did not mean they had full and complete understanding of God's entire plan. So John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But now he's saying, Is he the Messiah? He didn't have full and complete understanding of God's uh, larger plan. He had this understanding in his mind that Jesus Christ would come and he, as the Messiah, would rule and reign as a king immediately. He had this understanding that the Roman oppressors would be cast off. Uh, the Jewish uh, people would be the centerpiece of the entire world. And Christ would rule and reign. They put down all of their enemies. And they expected that immediately. So you see throughout Christ's life, the apostles and others, is now the time for the kingdom. Is now the time for the kingdom. Even in Acts, after the resurrection, asking, is now the time for the kingdom. So in John 10, 24, Jesus had some Jews come to him. It says, then came the Jews round about him. They surround him and they say unto him, how long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. They were questioning, right? Because their expectations of Christ, according to Old Testament prophecies, did not line up with what they were seeing in Christ. He's going to come. He's going to be mighty. He's going to rule and reign. The government's going to be upon his shoulders uh, and all people are going to answer to him. He's going to put down judgment and he comes and does what? He hangs out with the sinners, hangs out with the publicans, heals the poor. He shuns the religious crowd. He wasn't meeting their expectations. They say, this is not the Christ that we understood would come. Now, of course, they, they saw Old Testament prophecy about how Christ would rule and reign, and those are there. He will rule and reign. But he's going to rule and reign then when he comes back for a thousand years. He rules and reigns now in our hearts and all those who believe but the day is coming when he will literally actually rule and reign. But they didn't understand that distinction. So, John says, are you the one that should come? That's based upon some Old Testament teachings. That one would come. That phrase was used. Psalm 47, then said, I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. Psalm 118, 26, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. This idea throughout the Old Testament, there is one coming, there is one coming, there is one coming. So they said, are you the coming one? And they asked Christ if he was that one. So they expected the judgment and they expected a kingdom. John expected this. And that was reflected in his preaching. He says, now's the time. He's coming. He's going to purge his floor. He's going to gather the wheat to the garner. He's going to, he's going to put off the chaff. He's going to burn it with fire. He's saying, now's the time for the judgment. That wasn't wrong teaching. But when Christ came, it inaugurated the kingdom of God, which put people on notice saying, now, yeah, this ignorance in the times past, God winked at, but now all men everywhere need to repent. So yeah, it wasn't wrong teaching, uh, but John just didn't understand the timeline. So his expectations were not met by Christ, so he began to doubt. Well, Malachi chapter 3. Now this is the prophecy of John the Baptist. This is the Old Testament prophecy of John coming. And this is how the Old Testament ends, right? The prophecy of John the Baptist coming. Uh, so it ends saying, now you expect this forerunner of Christ to come. It then opens with the Gospels, and we see John the Baptist coming. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. 
And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. The same prophecy that prophesied uh, John the Baptist would come talks about how Christ is going to rule and he's going to reign and he's going to refine Israel. So John is expecting this. He says, this is me. (laughs) He looks at the Old Testament. Here's the forerunner. And then it says immediately after that, he's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be like a refiner's fire, like the fuller's soap. Uh, He's going to purify Israel. But that's not what happened. So he begins to doubt. He missed the already and the not yet. That is, yes, Christ has come. Yes, he has inaugurated the kingdom. Yes, people now need to repent. But this judgment and this final ruling and reigning still is in the distant. John didn't get it. Christ didn't fulfill his expectations. He began to doubt. So our circumstances, difficult life circumstances, incomplete knowledge of scripture, and erroneous expectations of Christ, they all contribute to doubt. We're going to close with this. Mark chapter 9. This will be an encouragement to you. Mark chapter 9, verse 17. Here's a man with a son, and his son is demon-possessed. And he wants Christ to heal his son. His son is demon-possessed. He's coming to Christ, and he wants his son to be healed. And you say, well, if your son's going to be healed, you've got to have faith. Okay, you've got to have faith. Which, by the way, Christ's healings in the New Testament very rarely were contingent upon faith, okay? He just healed indiscriminately. He basically wiped out sickness from uh, that uh, region while he was walking this earth. It w- he healed indiscriminately. Uh, sometimes you see faith, but most of the time it was not based upon faith. But here in this passage, Mark chapter 9, Christ is teaching us something about faith. Verse 17, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. That is, this possession caused him an inability to speak. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnashes with his teeth, and pineth away. Okay, so he's struggling, and he's, he's foaming at the mouth, and he's hurting himself. And I spake to thy disciples and, uh, that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered them and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. Don't you love the King James Bible? He wallowed foaming. Okay. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came upon him? And he said, of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe... All things are possible to him that believeth. That's a that's a uh, quite a burden he's placed upon this father. He says to the father, "Yeah, your son can be healed if you believe enough." And straightway the father of the child cried out with tears, cried out and said with tears, "Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief." When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him. Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. Here's a father. Jesus says, if you believe, anything can be done. The father says, I believe, but then help my unbelief. What honesty. What honesty. He says, God, I believe, uh, but I need help with my unbelief. Have you ever felt that way in your life? Yes, I believe, but there's such a, uh, I, I know that my faith falls short. Uh, there's, there's such uh, unbelief in my life. Yes, I believe. I want to believe more. Yes, I believe, but doubts still come in. This man had the foresight. He had the understanding that he could say, Christ, yes, I believe, but you help me. Help my unbelief. You can go to God and you can say, help my unbelief. That's comforting, isn't it? God's not saying, I will do all these things for you if you have the perfect measure of faith. And if you fall short in your faith, then forget it. He says Christ even has the compassion to help our unbelief. Well, 2 Timothy 2.13 says this, If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Why would it say that? 
Because our salvation is about something greater than ourselves. It's about God the Father and what he wants to do in our lives. And when we fail in our belief or when we have doubts, God is faithful to himself and he has promised that those whom he has predestined and called, he will glorify. He will bring every believer from the time of receiving Christ as Lord and Savior to glorification in heaven without fail for his own sake. So even when your faith, even when you doubt, even when your faith fails, he says he will not deny himself. He's going to bring you through, right? So I believe, but help my unbelief. Let's go ahead and pray. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That He should give His only Son. To make a wretch His treasure. 